Welcome to the Mindcraft Podcast. My name is Kimberly Quinn, and I have the pleasure of having the amazing DJ Nicholson with us here today. She is a dear friend of mine from our mastermind group, which is where we met. And DJ is, well, she's just super interesting for one, but she is an educational coach, a trainer, and this is my favorite, an inclusion specialist. And DJ is going to talk today with us, um, talk to us today about believing the possibility. And the context of believing the possibility has to do with DJ's passion and purpose and meaning, you know, sort of meaning with um, her mission to help children and their families who have disabilities. And her whole kind of theme here is yes, they can. Three exclamation points. So, DJ, welcome to the Minecraft podcast. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here. It's just going to be fun to hang out and chat with you and, and share share what I know and share from some info. And hopefully, you know, parents and families ha can have some really good takeaways that can support them in the end. Totally. We're going to talk about that, too, how you can reach DJ at the end. So, so DJ, maybe you and I were just talking about this kind of uh, off the record, as they say. And it's so interesting to me. So maybe you can start out also so our listeners are kind of on the same page as, you know, some people may know more than others. Um, maybe start by kind of explaining what you mean by um, not just believing the possibility, but presuming or assuming competence when you're talking about learning with children with disabilities or wiring differences. I, I love that. And I think that's a really good kickoff question because in, in the disability world, we talk a lot about presuming competence and why it's important to presume competence in all kids, regardless of disability and learning difference. So the simple definition of presuming competence really is making the assumption that every child can learn oh. and that whatever you present in the, in the educational sense, everything that you present to a child, they are taking in, they are processing, and they are learning what you are teaching them. So we are not in the business of making things easier for kids or taking it down to you know a preschool level, that we are presuming competence in their, in their grade level, in their age, whatever it is, and that we make adjustments we make accommodations and modifications for whatever they need in order to be the most successful so it's kind of it's a it's a it's a mindset oh, piece cool. where you have to, you have to truly believe that kids even if even if they they look different think different feel different whatever it is that they they have incredible possibility and we don't um we don't judge based on someone's looks or someone's ability that we absolutely know that they are completely capable of learning it's really up to us to figure out what's the best way to do that and you know part of this comes from so just on a personal note i my first experience with kids with disabilities um and helping parents with disabilities were really with my own parents so within my family structure, I had a sibling, have a sibling that has multiple different disabilities. So this was, you know, growing up in the seventies, the supports were not, were not the same. They weren't, there weren't nearly the number of supports that there are now. And so it was really challenging, um, you know, in hindsight for my parents to handle a speech and language disability, hang, handle, ADHD and other neurodiversities, you know, that mm -hmm. my sibling had. And so there was this, there was a stigma associated with having, you know, certain, certain disabilities. And it was something that was not talked about. So if it wasn't talked about, then it was certainly never embraced. And so, you know, I, I watched my, my parents struggle, you know, my, my entire childhood, well into adulthood. And, you know, my, my, feeling now, you know, now that I'm middle aged and I see, you know, parents still out there struggling and not knowing what to do and not knowing that their child really is 
very, very, very capable. It's up to the parents and the other members of that educational team at the school to put systems in place and put tools and learning strategies in in place so kids are successful. Because, you know, like we were talking about, you know, when we were pre, kind of pre-gaming it, yeah. um, you know, everybody, everybody learns different and we need to bring we need to bring different things to the table to make to make learning possible for everybody. I think that's fantastic. I'm wondering too, DJ, if you can, just so we, uh, you know, the, the, the listeners can see, you know, sort of relate even more. What are some of the, what are some of the learning styles broadly that you, that you, that you try to meet, say varying learning styles, I'm not, just so everyone who's listening can kind of get it, get the basic gist. Sure. So, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of, this goes for just humans in general, I right, think, not right, just right, kids, right. but, you know, some people are auditory learners and they right. can just listen, it's kind of that lecture style. They can listen and take it all in. Um, there's other people, other kids that need, they're more visual learners. So they need the illustrations. They need the diagrams that go along with things. They can be that movement centered kinesthetic learner where they need to be moving not necessarily moving in moving as it relates to what they're learning but just moving bouncing on a ball you know mm -hmm. rock standing on a rocker board or something to kind of um you know get get their brains uh ready to process information um and i i think that when we look at those three simple learning styles then we can we can start to to figure out okay within a classroom if we're trying to meet the needs of every child we have to have quite a bit available to us in if someone needs it and so for right. kids that have disabilities you know autism um cognitive disabilities learning disabilities and they have IEPs, which in the United States are individual education plans. Mm -hmm. They can have those, you know, different strategies and learning tools built in. So, so teachers and parents know what they can use to be the most successful. I love that, DJ. I'm thinking too how much, like you're talking about the 70s, and I'm a fabulous 59, so I know all too well. And even back in the early years when I was therapizing back in the 90s, and I did mm -hmm. the ball thing with the fast mind clubbers, you know, the yeah. and they actually were parents, other parents who complained because their child wanted to have a ball to sit on too. And I'm saying, ah, oh, this is about equity. Yeah. You know, and I and back then the word equity was not used very often and definitely not with the accuracy or the, the focus that it is now. Mm -hmm. with fair isn't always equal you know like right. and I, I what might you say with that as far as that relates to how you how you work with families like as far as what's good for for their child and what do you know what I mean I do I just want to take it before I answer that question I just want to take it back a little bit to what you said about equity and it not necessarily being fair because if it were fair it would be equal and everyone would have the same the same tools, the same resources, the same everything, even if they didn't need it. But in a truly inclusive classroom, mm -hmm. environment, culture, um, people, children know what's available to them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to help them learn better. So I think when we present it to kids as, hey, this is something that's really gonna gonna help you, and we and we respect and understand that everyone needs something a little bit different. And in that culture, in a classroom, when it's fostered correctly, and I could, and I say this because I've, I've seen it um, mm -hmm. being out, being out in schools that, you know, kids are really good about knowing what it is that they need when they're given some options, when they're given, you know, in, in the education, right, right, right. we call it that voice and choice that, you know, you can, you can sit in the blue plastic chair, you can sit on a bouncy ball, you can sit on the floor or whatever else is available in the classroom. Um, but so taking it back to your question about, about parents and how do we do this for kids, it's a matter of 
kind of digging deep with parents and having having some deeper conversations about you know what what do you see at, at home what what do you do at home to help your child settle or help them to focus is there something um that you know are they sitting on a different type of material are there sensory um concerns do they need to fidget with something which is so funny because yeah, right, you're right. fidgeting with a paper clip <laughs> No, well, we don't we don't outgrow some of these things. So we don't, we don't. But it's but it's a matter of having those conversations and figuring out like what what can we put in place for the most focus and the most grounded and centered child, so they feel regulated in school, so they feel ready to learn. And when they're ready to learn, we can hopefully be assured that they're going to take in what they're te what what teachers are teaching and be able to to process that information. Um, I have a great story. Um, if this is a good time to share a story, it's absolutely a good time. About presuming competence. So um, I worked with a family last year, and their son, who was in the fifth grade. Uh, was had had autism uh typically not very not very verbal you know would would script and used um an assistive communication device yep and so this their their child <clears throat> this family's child was in sel a self-contained environment was on a modified curriculum very little engagement mm -hmm. in school very you know not a lot of presuming competence um, at all. And so it was just kind of a very, parents were very, very um, defeated. You know, what can we do? I mean, he's in the fifth grade, he's watching, you know, bubble guppy cartoons during the day, like just really, really not appropriate. And so, you know, the, the, the mom and I especially did a really deep dive into, you know, so what, what is it? What is it that, that makes him connect? And, you know, we realized like, okay, he's a really auditory learner and so we we you know spoke with the rest of the iep team you know mm -hmm. during a meeting and we got things put into place where you know he was able to you know listen to a teacher's um direction and listen to their their teaching through headphones that then went into you know a, a, a device like an ipad and so he could read he could read um, what what she was saying, so you know his it went in, and then he was able to mm -hmm. kind of capture all his all the information, and so we realized in doing that, just trying it to see what would happen, we realized well he's also a very very fluent reader, he's reading fluently even though he's not typically verbal, and so what we realized was because he was such an avid reader because we were putting some things in place for him that really made him so much more engaged in school that there was a, a definite shift in the way his teachers saw his progress. So mm -hmm. instead of seeing a child that just kind of sat in a classroom, uninvolved, unengaged, kind of detached from everything and just kind of there, in the classroom, there was a shift to, huh, well, maybe we could try inclusion. Maybe we could try mm -hmm. having him go out into, you know, general education for part of the day. And so for part of the day, he went out for science and he just blossomed unbelievably. And so, you know, the work that he was given, you know, with his modified curriculum, he was going through, you know, a month's worth of work in three days and understanding and comprehending. And, you know, yeah. it's the whole presuming competence that they, they, they kind of kicked it up a notch and they decided, you know what, let's see how he does on a general standard track let's get let's give him let's give him all the things all the labs all the projects all the all the vocabulary and this child just soared exponentially and so we went from in a matter of you know eight months or so we went from him being in a self-contained setting 
with very little interaction with typical peers. He was out in, you know, a, a, a general ed setting for 15% of the day. We flipped that completely where he was then included in general education for 85% of the day and just had special ed support like for res uh, like a resource room support just just you know if you need help with you know some comprehension because the vocabulary is tough whatever it was um and the beautiful thing is not only did this kid get involved mm -hmm. in his learning because they presumed competence he also um started swimming started swimming at a local rec center with the support of a peer uh and you know last i talked to mom you know joined a little swim team wow so it was such an unbelievable shift in in who this child was surrounding himself with you know the parents of course were presuming competence but they didn't know like how do how do i how do i help my child and my child's teacher understand his potential and understand like listen you know he's autistic he's going to process things differently and you know the mom you know would say to me you know i know that he's getting it because he he takes in all this information and she says it like spins around in his brain and it comes flying out like two weeks later and it's exactly what he was taught like that two weeks before and so it's a matter of truly believing that it's possible because we we don't know, especially with kids that are that are neurodiverse, that have more complex um, cognitive ability and processing. We we don't know, we don't know. So if it, if they're showing what they know in a different way, or showing it at a different time, like two weeks later or they need more visuals to support what they're trying to say, or they need um, a graphic organizer to organize their thinking before mm -hmm. they write. If they need the oral practice and sharing their writing with someone before they put pencil to paper, or they speak it into a computer. I mean, there are just, there are countless, countless learning tools and supports out there for kids and you know one of the things that i hear a lot is these things are too expensive we don't have the money our district doesn't have the money my school's not going to pay for that so many of the things that i talk to parents about and i even talk about you know when i'm out coaching in schools is these are f available for free so much of the really high tech stuff it's built into our word processing programs it's built into google it's built into microsoft there are apps available there are what we consider in the you know special ed world to be like low tech tools mm -hmm. graphic organizers um little grips for your pencil uh reading rulers trackers all that stuff it's either no money or a nominal amount and it's there's such game changers i would think so I, i'm thinking of even a program that the you know the college where i where i teach dj so because now i have students who might have a learning impairment but sometimes it's just sometimes it's the fast mind crew uh -huh. with the adhd i, I prefer to use right. the positive phrase fast mind yeah. crew. and it's just sometimes it's just easier than when they're at night when they're tired or whatever like that and you literally it takes less than a minute you run the article through and out it comes with a link that reads it to you. I mean, it's amazing. You're talking about the seventies. This, none of this existed. Computers didn't even exist. Really? Right. right. It, so I'm thinking of that, how much easier it's gotten. And I think, you know, we have, a, we have a couple of neuro, neurodiverse ones in our family as well. And I, how much easier it is, but a bigger thing I wanted to bring up too, or as big um, is, is think about all this work you're doing that's not only helping the actual learning process. I was thinking about that little boy you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine when I was picturing him, as you said, in a self-contained environment, watching cartoons were way under his age range and intelligence range. Mental health wise, right. how was he, was he anything other than depressed? 
or you know right. maybe, i don't mean let's keep it from him but like up you know a child separated because we're not wired for separation as human beings to begin with and i'm thinking of these kids especially the nonverbal children who can't tell you think about once the you, the different strategies you're doing with parents mm -hmm. help to liberate them from that what this does for their self-esteem right. and happiness and all of it all of it all of it because so many of the things that you know that i can suggest to support at school are also things that can support at home right. and so you know a, a family that i worked with that was just pulling their hair out because their daughter would not get get it together in the morning to get out the door like they were constantly like you know get get dressed brush your teeth brush your hair and you know she would come out of the bedroom and wander around and the mom was like i don't i don't know what to do with her she is making me nuts she's taking like 45 minutes just to get ready and it should take her 10. and i said how do you how do you support her in her in her morning routine and the mom says well i just i just get so aggravated i just i feel like i'm just yelling at her all the time and i said well i said how many steps does she have in her morning right. routine right 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 she goes i don't know like five i said okay let's list off the five things and so she lists off the five things i said okay i'm going to create um a visual schedule for her she does she she gets up she brushes her teeth she brushes her hair she puts on her clothes she puts on her shoes she gets her backpack that's that's the order of things because some so often when kids have something to look at to look at a process of something it's infinitely easier and it's not easier just for the child i mean from the child's perspective it's growing independence it's right. growing you know accountability and you know confidence and all of that but then it frees up the mom to not be yelling to not start the morning all frustrated but frees her up to you know get breakfast get herself ready and you know let's be real i mean i have a calendar like right there you know that has sometimes i have days where i i need a step by step you know these these are the five things that you need to do today do this one do this one because you know i i certainly while i've never been diagnosed with adhd i have so many characteristics i sure do and i'm embracing them um, but, but again, I like, even for myself, I have to put some systems in place. I have to have some tools. And so we, we have to recognize that in kids too. And I think, you know, I, I think it goes beyond, it goes beyond a label. It goes beyond uh, a disability, a diagnosis, an exceptionality or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. I think we have to just give kids what they need to be successful because we are assuming that they will be i love that i love that and i love the story with this with this mom dj too because i can i can kind of you know picture that and i think a lot of times well-meaning parents just don't know what to do which is where you come in and here, right. here's the thing though i think a lot of times because parents we are doing the best we can and sometimes it takes us a while to figure out our child's executive functioning situation mm -hmm. but if she's yelling every day you have to stop and ask without judgment how's that working for you right like, is it making her go faster is it making her get on the bus i'm gonna guess no maybe even slower because it's frustrating right. you know and, and work through, and the other thing is i love how you do the steps because that's definitely we our, our oldest daughter's on the spectrum so you know definitely breaking it down and for the fast mind club too, mm -hmm. one step at a time, you know, brush your teeth, then it's done. Get your backpack, then it's done. Right. And then she sees success. Mom stops yelling. The whole house feels less frustrated. And right. the, child feel, the child feels as if she's successful. Right. And I think, you know, there when and you know right now we're kind of just talking about you know list making and that structure but i feel mm -hmm. like you know if that's something that's put into place and kind of gets normed um when mm -hmm. kids are young you know that's just a tool that 
that we use even as adults in life. I mean, I, do. I think, yeah. And I think if people sat down and really thought about the supports that they use in their life so they, they don't forget things, so they can remind themselves about certain things, so they can keep themselves right. regulated, that's, that's a huge, that's a huge part of it. I mean, we all do things every day to keep us regulated and present and feeling mm -hmm. grounded and feeling less anxious. No, hundred percent. Actually, that's why I love, uh, they're starting to teach finally mindfulness in the, in the schools, which is fantastic. That's and awesome. Also, oh yeah. I admire our now, our, our oldest, they, yeah, when, when our youngest son was six, they started and he's now 29. So our little town's been doing that for a long time. Super important. But also I like how you said DJ, because just like we teach math and like all these things we teach early on, there's, there's without well-being. And I mean, a big umbrella of it. Okay. Right. Executive functioning and self-esteem without well-being, nothing else matters. <laughs> you know, the math's no. not going and this isn't good. If they don't have friends, if they're not feeling social, if they're not feeling good about themselves and part of things then rest of it's a gigantic waste of effort. So, so that's why I, I think that the work you're doing is absolutely amazing because some of these steps, like you say, we as grownups, I know I do. When things start to get, feel the monkey mind chatters flying around and everything, I'm like, okay, sometimes I'll even step out. Nobody's going to bother you in the bathroom, right? Go in the right. Bathroom <laughs> right. And say, okay. What oh, it's one of the books we're reading to the essentialist when what what's important now that acronym what's yeah. important now for that little girl and her mom it might be getting out the door so it's the backpack for us in the middle of a work day when maybe there's some drama going on that's not okay and making us spin a little bit the deep breath separating taking a step back and saying what is the one thing I need to do to get out the door and you're teaching that you know, or you're helping parents to teach that younger. I think that's fantastic. But by the time they're 40 and 50, they're going to, their, their anxiety levels will be so much less than those of us out there now who didn't learn it. Right. Right. And I think, you know, it's important to give kids learning tools when they're young. Yes. So we can have more inclusion. I mean, I'm a firm believer that, you know, every child can be in, be included in learning when we give them the right tools. Right. But inclusion and being part of a community leads to belonging. And, yes. you know, I, I heard a great quote just this morning. I loved it because it really resonated with me that the opposite of belonging is fitting in. Oh, yes. Brene Brown. is Brene Brown. Brown. Yeah, it was Brene yeah. Brown. The opposite of belonging is fitting in. And I had to, I had to listen to it a couple of times. And I really, you know, thought about that this morning, like, even as, even as a young adult, the things that I did in oh. order to fit in oh, with people that I look back and I'm like, why did you even do that? Like, that's not even you at all. Like, that's no. not at all. But when we, when we let kids, when we honor kids enough to let them, you know, be unique and, and have the tools that they need and sit where they need to sit to be regulated and, and settled and, and all of that. And we embrace those unique parts of kids. I mean, that's, that's true belonging. That's when we're really including everyone regardless. As they are. As they as are. They right? are. Because yeah. I'm going to agree with you, the fitting in. I mean, don't we even slip out of that sometimes? Even though we're pretty in a pretty good place in our 40s and 50s, don't we occasionally slip in a conversation and maybe, I don't know, maybe not exactly say what we really mean, but, you know, just in the slightest of ways? Yeah. Change, changing our tone a little bit. And I'm thinking that's the fitting in part, changing anything about you to be approved of by somebody or a group right. of somebody's. Right. It's so stupid. So, so I, I think the fact that you're teaching the belonging thing on, you know, younger, the belonging thing younger is fantastic. Because I think a, a lot of grownups struggle with that their whole lives. I do too. At various moments. I'm not saying maybe all the time, but in various contexts, whether it's work or 
friends groups or whatever can struggle right. I think. And you know I I think too um you know bringing it back to what what you said earlier about um what was it I lost my thoughts. Um I don't know. It just went right out of my brain. <laughs> No, we can, that, that happens to me. That's my everyday. Oh, I know what it was. I know what it was. Um, the idea, the 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 thought of when like parents as well as teachers get completely overwhelmed with with you know at home with with homework and bedtime and and meals and cleaning and all all the things Everything. about home like, and yeah. then in school you know it's 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 planning and assessments and it's people coming in to observe and all the, all the things that go along with teaching. When we're in that overwhelmed place, it's very hard to take in new information and Absolutely. to go out and look for new information. So I think that's where, you know, I mean, I, I feel like I have a really big role and responsibility that I, that if I can kind of be that person that says, look, we're going to work on reducing the overwhelm. We're going to reduce the overwhelm because just in a situation like, you know, there's, I'm, I'm down here in Florida, you know, there are dozens of kids that have, you know, a, a high needs associate or a person that's attached mm -hmm. to them to help them in school. Wouldn't it be easier to teach kids how to do some of, some of these things on their own to give them a, a schedule of the school day so they they don't have so they don't get dysregulated or that we give them um you know a little visual support so we give them a timer of how long they have left to work so they're not asking an adult am i am i done yet how much how much more time do we have that we give right. them self-sufficiency we, we get yeah we give them tools to to breed that independence sometimes it's the smallest little shift in in learning supports that makes the biggest difference because it's going to it's going to grow that that self-sufficiency grow the independence and um self-esteem and self-esteem and and take some of the weight off of of teachers and parents when we teach kids how to do to do that and you know i i talk a lot in, in my in my coaching about you know it's important to know what to do but it's equally as important to know how to do it. Right, right. And so you can teach a child how to do it, but also know why. Like, why are we putting yeah. some of these things in place um, to increase independence and ultimately increase learning? I love this whole approach of teach them to fish. You know, no matter, rather than fishing for them, right? Right. That old, that old cliche, because even no matter how, you know, the spectrum of severity. Are you talking about the young man nonverbal and the fact, how do we even know what's going on in his mind if he can't get, you know what I mean? Right. And, and to really, to give, to, to, to help a child be as independent as he or she can be, mm -hmm. I think is the biggest gift, you know? Oh, because absolutely. everything that goes with it. Absolutely. And, you know, and I, I talk to parents and I think one of the hardest questions that I ask especially if it's a, a young family and their child is young, I'll right. say, what do you want for your child when they're 25? Oh, I like that. Like, what do you, I don't even know. They're like, I'm 25. I said, okay, but I want you to think what we're doing now, even though they're in second grade, what we're doing now is going to help set the stage. We're going to set the stage for what you want for your mm -hmm. child. And then by the time, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're in, they're in middle school or high school, those kids can take ownership and they can say, this is what I want for myself, or right. this is what I know is possible for myself because I've had the right supports along the way. And people have believed in my possibility, you know, do you, do you, do you want your child to be independent and an entrepreneur or holding down a traditional job or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what do you, what do you, what do you want for them? Because I, I do feel like, you know, by the time kids are in high school, that's, that's late to be having, you know, those, those kind of conversations that if we, if we can get them, get the let's, jump. let's get them when they're little, oh, you know, I think it's start those conversations. 
Oh, I think it's fantastic. Just the the autonomy. I love the question, DJ, about with, you know, what do you want for them? Let's say by twenty five. So you give them a visual, you know, for twenty five. You know, yeah. you know, I just, oh gosh, I love that. So this sounds like a, a fantastic place to maybe talk about th those of you who are listening, and if you've got children or nieces or nephews, or you coach, or you're in a school system, you know, any everybody who deals and manages and enjoys, you know, and educates and all those, and all those things, a child who's neurodiverse has some sort of, you know, cognitive slash physical differences that, um, that if, if you want to reach out to, to DJ, DJ does coaching mm -hmm. with, with parents, families, educators. I don't know. So I, I coach, I coach um, parents and families. It's more of a guided, supportive stance rather than um, an advocacy stance where I'm going to go in and fight uh, right. with the school team. I'm, I, that is not my approach at all. Um, my philosophy in my coaching and my guidance is that, you know, we lead with kindness and we lead with um, collaboration for the for the best needs of children so i really am a parent guide in knowing what's absolutely possible for their child in school when they're given the right supports Excellent. Um, and your information um, will be right in the blur below the youtube video absolutely absolutely yep and i'm also um starting next week i'll be offering um through through i'm going to do it through facebook and zoom um half hour question and answer sessions once a week, um, four o'clock Eastern time every Tuesday. So if parents and educators have questions or need to problem, so problem solve something that I'm available to kind of get the ball rolling. Oh, excellent. So we'll put those two links in there as well. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. Okay. Well, fabulous. It sounds like just, uh, this has been a fantastic conversation, DJ, and I, I can't thank you enough for talking about um, believing, you know, believing the possibility, you know, yes, they can. And yeah. yes, they can. You they know? can. And they can do it. And I'd like to thank you uh, for using your life minutes in this way to be with us today and to, to share your, your wisdom and your knowledge base that you have with this and really opening a door that a lot of parents may not know was there. So I think that's huge. So thank you for being here with us today. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you.